set it up for best. To Charlton. What a goal! On a football field, Bobby Charlton had it all. Balance and grace, verve and swerve and dash. But most of all, besides an innate old-fashioned chivalry, he had an epic poet's feel for high-explosive drama, a panache which few men have remotely equaled in all the long legends of an enduring and lovely game. A long, a beautiful body swerve to King. Lord Ashton in the middle. And here comes Charlton. Oh, a great goal! For 17 years, from 1957, he bewitched friend to the point of ecstasy and foe to the point of exasperation. He had a vision, a joy about the game that was at once both sophisticated and simple. Yet it should all have been nothing. For a quarter of a century ago, on February the 6th, 1958, Bobby Charlton, at 21, survived an air crash which wiped away half his Manchester United playmates. The gods spared the one-time urchin from the Northumberland coal field, who now lives quietly in the plush and deserving businessman's belt down the country road from the Friends of Old Trafford. They take it in the stairs, I don't he was a Milburn, and, and the very first to notice that there flickered the light of greatness in their shy young nephew were his four uncles, all league footballers themselves. They were terrific heroes of mine. I, I couldn't wait for them coming home at weekends to tell me all the tales about the different things that had happened to them the day before. And Jackie Milburn, obviously, everybody knows about, who, who was uh, my mother's cousin. Uh, and I used to go to watch him every other week in Newcastle. For Newcastle, me and our Jack would, would save our money up, two and five and eight me cost us to, to get there. That's in the old money. How did um, you get there? By bus. The two, two and five and eight me included the bus fare, our lunch, at, our lunch at the Civic Restaurant in Newcastle and entrance to the, to the game, which was, I think it was 6p or something like that. Now over to St James's Park, where Villa kick off against cup holders Newcastle in stripes in what turned out to be the thriller of the third round. The Magpies soon get... Somewhere in the vast throng this very afternoon might have been the kid, Bobby, and his lanky elder brother, Jack, who was also destined to play for England. Just as their cousin from Ashington, Jackie Milburn, already did. But here's cup winner Jackie Milburn setting Newcastle off with a pass to Fuchs. It's a bad clearance. Mitchell collects, takes his time and centres over to Walker. Walker heads back and Fuchs runs in to score for Newcastle. This was the religion the boy was bred on, with the hymns demanding victory soaring up from the great cathedral. It was ever so at St James's Park. Now Newcastle are all out to save the game. 13 minutes to go. Mitchell shoots and it's all square. Two minutes later and Mitchell has scored again. Now the Geordies are really jumping. Robledo scores the fourth and three goals in five minutes start Newcastle on the road to Wembley. Six old pence, and uh, and for that, I mean, I was able to go and watch your your Jackie Milburns and your Stanley Matthews and your Len Shackleton's and Wilf Mannions, a whole lot of them, the streams and streams of these wonderful people that I only used to read about in the papers or hear about on the radio, and it just sort of my relationship with my uncles fostered me my love of the game, and I, it was just a passion that I had. I had to become a footballer at all costs. If St James's Park was the weekend cathedral, the long streets of Ashington, ribboned by tiny miners' cottages, was the little lad's daily parish. He was already obsessed with his beautiful game. I, I just learned to play with some of the, the bigger lads, and me and our Jack used to, to always get included in this and uh, play with miners who had no equipment. Uh, and if the football burst, you know, I mean, that was the greatest tragedy of all because then you'd have to go home and nobody wanted to go home. All they wanted to do was play football. It was, it was a hotbed of football. It's, I don't think it, there's any, anywhere like it in the whole world. What was Jack like as a player at that time? My brother Jack was, uh, he was... He was a good player. He was a bit... A, a bit he aggravated people, I always remember that. I, I actually watched him in a derby match. 
he played for the Hearst Park, Hearst Park and they were playing against the Hearst East, which was only about 300 yards away, this other school, but a deadly rivalry. And he gave a goal away and they lost. And when he came home, I was very clever, you know, and I said, uh, I remember saying to him, why, you were stupid giving that daft goal away, you know, whatever. And he punched me straight off the top of, <laughs> straight off the back of the couch onto the floor, you know. He was an uncompromising character in that. Uh, I don't know if he remembers it, but I remember it all right, yeah. Jack was first to be seen off to football and fame by mum and dad. Of the two other brothers, Gordon never aspired to be more than a keen and capable amateur, though Tommy, the youngest, was a real chip off the old family tree. The things that, I, that I'm, you try to look for when you're at a football club or you're looking at a young player is to see whether he's got movement, whether he's got balance, whether he's got the easy control, etc. And my youngest brother had it all, and he's never, ever tried to be a footballer all these years. I says, why did you never make an effort? And he said, well, he says, well, all the headlines you and our Jack had got over the years, I thought, well, if I didn't really make the top, uh, it would appear to be pointless exercise. What a waste, I thought. My youngest brother, Tommy. Bobby's magnificent obsession was not wasted. Even at 10, he was spending holidays at Chesterfield, where Uncle George was trainer. I mixed with the footballers, I joined in, I travelled with them. I, I really got to know what made a footballer tick. And a football club tick, um, I learned all about... I, I learned what an industrial language was for, <laughs> for certain, you know. After a few days, they forgot that little Bobby Charlton was there and the language was as blue as it had always been. One, one thing always sticks in my mind in particular was, was when uh, one person who was the captain um, and who also took the penalty kicks wasn't picked and he asked to see the manager. And I heard every word of the conversation, which was the, why, why the player thought he shouldn't be dropped and the manager telling him why he thought that he should be dropped. Um, and, and the player eventually finished the conversation with, but, but boss, I take penalties. <laughs> you know, like that was, the, that was one of the main reasons why he should still be playing. It, it struck me as not right, that, you know. I thought, That's, that can't be right, that, you know. You've got to be doing a little bit more than just take penalty kicks, but... Was Newcastle United the natural progression for you? Well, everybody seemed to think that I would go to Newcastle because I used to go and watch them play. But I think the real reason that, that, that I went to, to Manchester United rather than to Newcastle was that there was a little old man called Joe Armstrong who was the coach, who was the, the chief scout for Manchester United. And he was the first one to come and ask me to be a professional footballer. He was 15. The young man from the northeast acknowledged family destiny and went west to study football, although he'd already, of course, played for England schoolboys. Apprentices always have to start all over again. I had to suddenly learn to be a professional footballer instead of just being a, quite a good amateur. Um, and how that was brought about was the work that was done on me by Jimmy Murphy, who was the assistant manager at Manchester United in those days. Matt Busby was so high in the club and, and held under such esteem, you know, I, I mean, you never got close to him when you were my age. First of all, you had to go through all the different stages, the fourth team, the third team, etc. And the best juniors in the country were coming to Manchester United. And at 16, 17, 18, having to play in open ages against working lads from, from the big factory air, factories around Manchester who all had teams in the Manchester League. And uh, we used to have to play against them and it, it toughened you up a little bit. And I, I wouldn't have done without that. Who were your contemporaries then who were coming through the junior United sides? Well, the, the, the one that stood head and shoulders above everyone else was Duncan Edwards. Um, what was he like? Well, it's very difficult to say. Um, he, was, he was as near perfect as you could get. Because I remember Jimmy Murphy. Well, he said, I've got... Uh, I've got this player, Bobby. He says, I'm, I'm dying for you to play with him. He says, what a player. He says, he's got, uh, he says, Duncan Edwards it is. He comes from the Midlands, a little place called Dudley. And he's good in the air, a good right foot, good left foot, strong in the tackle, very fast, a tremendous shot, can play in any position. He says, and, and when I've worked on him for, a, for a, a year or so, I says, I'm going to make him a really decent player. As though he didn't have enough, you know. 
It was like a man playing with boys, and he was only 17 when I first bumped into him. And uh, he ran the whole, the whole game. Now just 18, the wondrously precocious Edwards was the youngest ever to play for England. At once, he was one of the very hubs around which the national side revolved. Oh, Duncan Edwards come across extremely well there. Very fine piece of anticipation by Duncan Edwards. And he clips this ball down the line to Colin Granger. And there's Tommy Taylor come in and he's going to pull... Oh, he's pushed it through to Clayton. And Clayton hits a beautiful ball across to Stanley Matthews who collects it. As well as Edwards, Manchester United gave two other young men, Taylor and Byrne, to this 1956 England side, which beat Brazil by 4-2 at Wembley. Edwards to Haynes. Jalma Santos, Paulinho, Edwards, Matteo. Edwards was exactly a year older than Charlton. Back at Old Trafford, Bobby strove mighty hard to keep up with such shining talents. I had to do my uh, apprenticeship really through uh, Jimmy Murphy, who was the assistant, and Bert Wally the coach who for two years really gave me a hard time in football because I always wanted to just play and to, to go out with the ball and do whatever I wanted to do. And suddenly when I wanted to, to do something on the field, they would stop me, pull me away and try to instill some thoughts into me. Brainwashing, I think, is, is probably a good way of describing it. When I'm at the most impressionable age, get hold of, get hold of me and, and get rid of all my bad habits if they can. At last, the call. The young, athletic Charlton to take on the still powerful Charlton Athletic. I'd, three weeks before, I, I'd been injured in a, in a tackle in a reserve match at Main Road, and my, my right ankle was swollen up, and it took a while to go down. It was quite painful. Um, and I hadn't played in the, in the reserves for a few weeks. And he called me up to his room and said, I'm, I'm playing you in the first team tomorrow. And if it was one time I didn't really want to play, it was that day against Charlton Athletic, it was. And, uh, but I said, he said, are you all right? Is your foot all right? And I said, yes, yeah, all right. And, uh, and I played and I, I carried it a bit, you know, I carried it a bit, but uh, the first match against Charlton Athletic. And I remember after the match, uh, we won 4-2 and I was lucky enough to score two goals. Uh, it was really hard because all the players used to say, you can play in reserve matches and 18 matches all your life, but until you actually play in the first division, you don't realize how much you've got to give of your body, like and running, and, and you, you push yourself through pain barriers, which you never do in reserve team games. So he was a Busby babe. In the history of the game, there's never been such a unique collection of eager, youthful flair than that which Matt Busby and his staff had assembled with such daring precision and loving care. With fatherly pride, Busby himself led out his boys for the Wembley Cup final of 1957. I'd really only visited the first team. Whenever anyone was injured, I, I would draft it in. Never really thought that I'd be playing in the FA Cup final. And we, we played Aston Villa in a very controversial match where Uni United had already won the championship and this was the double that they were going for against Aston Villa. And we lost our goalkeeper, Ray Wood, with a, with a collision, when he had a collision with uh, Peter McParlane, the left winger for Villa. It, it put us completely out of our stride. Jackie Blanchflower had to go in goals and we had to readjust our positions. No substitutes, if you can remember, in those days. And we lost the match 2-1. Great disappointment, um, because we didn't really play football. We never were really given the chance to play at all after, after that. It was unfortunate, but Aston Villa played well on the day and, and beat us. They, they beat us fairly, you know, not squarely maybe, but they beat us fairly. Although United lost, they had already won the league championship and so qualified once more for the European Cup. Among other things, Busby and his rampant youngsters pioneered Britain's challenge abroad. The previous league champions, Chelsea, had not even deigned to take their place in Europe. Now it was to become Busby's overwhelming inspiration. And through it, he sought to blow fresh winds and dramas into the narrow, pinched and parochial English game. I used to love... European matches, and always did at Old Trafford. For years and years, it was, it was always packed out, packed solid for any European competitions. 
European Cup semi-final second leg. Madrid won the first encounter by three goals to one, so United must get three clear goals in this match to reach the final. Real Madrid race across the Old Trafford turf, and Matt Busby's boys and their 60,000 fans realise it's not going to be easy. But by golly, they're going to do their darndest. After 25 minutes, Copa takes a pass in the penalty area and shoots a low one. So began nine minutes of dramatic, decisive soccer. From the very beginning, Bobby had been matched against some of the most celebrated names in the world. Here's Madrid's second. Hento passes, Real shoots. Too easy. On come the floodlights for the second half. Manchester, four goals down in the aggregate, need a miracle to save them. Is this it? Peg centers. Taylor does the rest. Real are a splendid soccer machine and one of the leading continental sides, while Manchester United, of course, are league champions, second year running, and FA Cup finalists. Another peg pass, and Charlton scores a beauty. They've equalised, but it's farewell to European Cup hopes. Next year, Busby's glittering young family was even more skilled and battle-strong. All Europe watched, entranced. In the quarter-finals, on a snow-hard pitch in Belgrade, they swept aside the Red Stars even before half-time. Charlton, now the exuberant Prince Regent of the line, scored two of the three. And they left for England in an excited babble of triumph. Now they were just one match away from the European final. Here is the news. So far, we know there are 23 survivors after Manchester United's air crash at Munich this afternoon. Of the crew of six and 38 passengers on board, including a baby, these are the people so far known to have survived. Of the Manchester United party, Matt Busby, manager, and the following players. Greg, Wood, Folks, J. Blancheflower, Morgans, Berry, Charlton, Violet, and Scanlon. Eight players were among the 23 who died. Byrne, Bent, Coleman, the magnificent Edwards, Jones, Pegg, Taylor, and Whelan. Charlton miraculously was treated for little more than shock, though Matt Busby was to fight for his life in the Munich hospital for weeks. The accident happened where Manchester United team was probably at its peak. They'd reached uh, the semi-final of the European Cup uh, by, by going through against Red Star Belgrade, which were, who were really top-class opposition. Uh, and on the way back, uh, the accident happened, and the, the club and the players that um, would never, ever be the same again, you know. I'd like to say a few words to my mother. I hope she's OK yes. and taking it well. Look at her while you're doing it. She, she, hasn't, she hasn't been down to see me, you know, but it's a bit a long way and I'm all right. I it know. have been a bit worse off, like some of the others. I don't really think about the accident as such. I think about the people and the players involved, you know, because most of them that were killed were really good personal friends of mine. Uh, Duncan Edwards and uh, David Pegg, Eddie Coleman, Tommy Taylor. I was, I was just lucky. I've, I mean, I'm, I've always been lucky. It's, it's unbelievable, really, that something like that should happen and all your pals get killed and suddenly you're, you're there with hardly a scratch on you. I just... Sometimes I feel it doesn't seem right, you know. But they were, they were lovely lads, all of them, and good players, and uh, the memory of them will always be at Manchester United. An eerie, numbed and grieving hush settled over England, indeed over the whole football world. Yet even while the father figure fought on in Germany, fortified by the last rites of his Catholic Church, his stewards cobbled together another team. And within a fortnight, Manchester United were playing again. I think I would have, I would have really had to spend a lot of sleepless nights after that if it wasn't for the fact that the club and Mad Busby um, was still alive. Jimmy Murphy took over the reins and we, we literally had to keep going, otherwise the club could have gone under. 
Old Trafford and 60,000 were there to see virtually a new United 11 take the field. Billy Fuchs, number two, now their captain, won the toss, and no sooner had this fifth round match got going than Sheffield Wednesday and Stripes were under fierce pressure by a club determined to rise again from disaster. Bobby Charlton injured in the crash, and Mr. Murphy, understudy to Matt Busby, now saw the ball curl into Wednesday's goal from a corner by Brennan. It was certainly something to cheer about, as the Manchester boys crossing over with a goal in hand now proceeded to go further ahead. Pearson's shot was half cleared, but young Brennan was there to bang it in. Two goals by the ex-third team winger. Wednesday had their aggressive moments, but Munich survivors Harry Gregg in goal and Billy Fuchs right back were a very strong combination in defence. Five minutes from time now, and Manchester United, still not content, attack again. And through 18-year-old Dawson, they score again. A great victory and a match that will long be remembered. As the chairs followed the men of Manchester into their dressing room, what must they have been thinking? So, round after round, the patchwork team was carried further on waves of passion. Such was the sentiment at Old Trafford, the, the atmosphere at that time. I, I really felt sorry for teams that had to play against us, because it was very difficult for them. Wembley's Empire Stadium is certainly a very powerful magnet on the great day. A hundred thousand or so were there, and they fairly cheered Matt Busby, who had recovered sufficiently to be present, as his Manchester United men came out beside their white-shirted opponents, Bolton Wanderers. Then Bobby Charlton sets the ball rolling, and the match of the season is underway. Bolton are soon driving down the left wing. They force a corner. Less than three minutes have passed when Brian Edwards puts in a perfect cross and Nat Lofthouse does the rest. It's a goal! <laughs> Manchester's forward line attack again and a slowed down camera shows the brilliance of a Hopkinson save. Every spectator at Wembley must now have looked forward to more thrills in the second half. After Bolton had kicked off, United were soon away at full speed in search of the equaliser. And after eight minutes play, a fizzer from Charlton comes back off the post into Hopkinson's arms. A narrow shave for Bolton. But two minutes later, they were attacking. Then a hard shot from Stevens is held by Greg, and Lofthouse puts him and the ball into the net. Well, that's almost the end of the story, for although there was plenty of good football, there was no more scoring. Bolton Wanderers had certainly earned congratulations for their fourth Wembley win, while Manchester United deserved the highest praise for reaching Wembley against all odds. Bolton Wanderers beat us 2-0, and the bubble hadn't burst because the momentum of Manchester United had continued, even though this, this terrible tragedy had happened. He did say, Mad Busby, that it would take five years for the club to be really established as a, as a real football power again. And it was nearly to the day in 1963 that we, uh, we won the FA Cup. So it came to pass. Five years and three months after Munich, Busby's new team, certainly by national and possibly even by royal command, laid waste Leicester City at Wembley. Leicester had conceded only two goals in their whole cup run. But on the day, their goalkeeper, Gordon Banks of all people, was unable to cope with Charlton and United Verve. Busby's Manchester were themselves again. That was like Manchester United was OK, you know. Don't need to worry about it anymore. And the following year, we won the championships. We won the championship and we had very, very successful few years, it was marvellous. And alongside the now majestic Charlton, stirring new princes were in attendance. Dennis Law running beautifully. Dennis Law there, and the ball is still there. It's free. Dennis Law, and he's scored! 
Dennis Law had come from Italy, um, who for a period of a couple of years was absolutely breathtaking, you know, the way Why? he used to take goals. Well, a, a half chance and it was in without before he even thought about it. Very brave, beat goalkeepers, dribble round them, uh, head balls, very, go in when other people would never go in and, and score goals. And the crowd loved him because he used to, to hold his hands up to them, you know, and, and show that they, they were all a part of it. And, and they loved Dennis Law and uh, George Best, who came, a young lad, and, and really turned some fullbacks inside out. In the sun, but it was Best who picked up that kid flick. Driven wide. Yes! He got himself into, into all sorts of problems because I think maybe got a little bit too soon. And I don't really think that he had the same sort of um, treatment from Jimmy Murphy, if we can say. Jimmy Murphy, by that time, you know, was coming to the retirement age and wasn't doing this, this sort of work that he had done in the past. And I think that a lot of players, not just George Best, missed that sort of treatment. But I'll, I'll always think of, of the George Best with full-backs chasing him, trying to kick him, but never able to succeed. He was a, he was a marvellous player. Uh, and, and also, in that, in that category, of, of great players, I would have to put Nobby Styles. What was he like to play with? Well, you tend not to think of a defender as being world class, but but Nobby Styles had a, had a gift for sniffing danger. There was a there was a period of about two or three years where he used to play everyone's defensive position for him. If the, if the right half got in trouble, without anybody having to tell him, he'd go and the trouble would be solved. He would cover fullbacks, centre halves. He, he would. He could smell danger when it was coming, and he'd nip it in the bud. And fearless tackler, and then as soon as he, as soon as he'd done his job, he'd go up and give it to a forward player or a midfield player and said, "I've done it. Now you do yours." Manchester United versus Real Madrid, two of the most successful and highly respected teams in the football world today, meeting in the first leg of the European Cup semi-final. Manchester United, the English League champions, the mighty Real Madrid, already champions of Spain this season, and six times winners of the European Cup. The ground at Old Trafford packed with a capacity crowd of 63,500 people. Who paid 1968 had arrived. Busby, Charlton, and the stalwart defender, Bill Fuchs, were now the only direct survivors from the ashes of Munich. Once again, United were only two matches from the European final, and once again, the regal figures from Madrid stood in their way. Sutter. Sutter the crowd. Perez to Piri. Styles. to get good flick that was my best this is Aston again the cue at the far post for the cross if he can get it back ran well for him best oh, a real good goal we didn't think that, that was enough to go through to to play Madrid in the Bernabeu Stadium with all the fanatical Spanish supporters that we, we knew about such a slender advantage made it ominous for the second leg in Madrid. United filed determined into the now familiar cauldron of the Bernabeu Stadium. And Nobby Styles had an even more resolute glint to his glasses. But once on the field, even Charlton, who'd seen it all, was to be amazed at Real's skills all through the first half. Neither he nor the wizard Best had a chance to retort as the Spaniards offered a sumptuous feast to their supporters. Within 45 minutes, United's 1-0 lead was gone, and Real were now ahead by 3-2 on aggregate. Madrid had, had sort of overrun us and had whatever bit of luck was going, but they'd, they'd broken us completely, and, and we were sitting in at half-time completely de dejected, thinking, well, is that it, you know, because we couldn't possibly imagine uh, that anything could be other, any different in the second half. And, and even Matt Busby, I remember, f you know, trying very hard to lift us, but... What did you say? 
Well, I mean, he was as depressed as the next thing. He thought that it had gone, you know. And we went out second half and, and just kept on working and trying to do the right things. And for no accountable reason, they had completely lost it. You know, I, I just could never understand it. Maybe we, we kidded ourselves into thinking that they could play like that for 90 minutes, but they couldn't. And they probably didn't play against a lot of opposition like us who would, who would keep coming at them all the time, even though we're behind. And we hadn't been broken, and yet they must have thought that we had. And we got a break. David Sadler went up and, and, and knocked the ball in from not a very attractive goal. Suddenly we're level on aggregate, you know. And at right, you know, if we hang on, if we hang on, we still think this, if we hang on, we might get a, a replay in Lisbon. It was decided that it was going to be in Lisbon. And we kept on playing, and, and they seemed to be fighting amongst themselves, little, little arguments going on between players, which is always a good sign for the opposition. You know, it picks you up a little bit when you think that they're not completely happy. And then suddenly, George Bez got the ball on the right-hand side, and, and with what he's good at, he'll take one man on without any difficulty. And he'd beaten the full-back, and George Best pulled the ball back, and Bill Folks, who'd never ventured over the halfway line, I don't think, in any time I'd ever seen him play hardly. Uh, and he slotted the ball as professionally as you like, straight into the far corner, and, and we, we would, we'd come back from the dead. All I can remember is hordes and hordes of United supporters. I mean, whether they tried to keep them off the field or not, I don't know, but it didn't stop. They just charged over, they picked up all our players and, and carried them away, because we'd really come back from the dead. We, we'd had it. Indeed, by any reasoning, Bill Fuchs' outrageously unlikely winning goal could only be described as heaven sent. <laughs> Through his tears, Charlton sought out Busby, and together they gave thanks, as well to Jimmy Murphy, who'd seen his one-time apprentice turn sorcerer himself. The final was to be at Wembley against the mighty Benfica from Portugal. The man on whom the real burden rests, Matt Busby has lived 11 dedicated years for this moment. Surely the prize couldn't elude him now. No score in a scrappy first half, but the garden was full of such rich blooms, something had to blossom. In the second, it did. Eusebio, the greatest scorer in European soccer. Coluna, Benfica's captain. Twice they've won this European Cup before. George Best, one of Manchester's miracle men. Pat Quirin getting pretty close. David Sadler picked the ball up on the left-hand side of the field to cross it, and I knew he was going to cross it, so I went to the near post. So I, didn't, I didn't score many headers, but that was probably most important. So we were off then and, and thought we were, we were going to do it. After the tumult and the shouting, George Best has a try, but Coluna steals it from him. Could be trouble for United. spot of bother. Referee Low Bellow sorts it out. Charlton's worried. Best has been injured. Luckily, a quick recovery and Benfica's goalie ready for this onslaught by Best and Sadler. <laughs> Centre-half Bill Fuchs as Benfica advance. A centre from Torres and Gracia equalises. Suddenly, the rhythms had changed. Eusebio was in full pomp now, and only Stepney saved United. Alex Stepney made the most unbelievable save from Eusebio, which, as it turns out, was about a minute or two from the end. And then we were forced into extra time, which had surprised me a bit, because I thought we would, we would still we would beat them. But extra time held no fears for, for me. 
Here's the sequence that writes their golden chapter in the records. Three goals in eight minutes. Number one, Best takes his time before driving it home. The next one comes from a corner. Charlton's kick swings across for Kidd to head and score on the rebound. Three goals to one. United have got it made. And within a few minutes, I pick the ball up, knock it out to Brian Kidd. He's going down the touchline, and I, I, it's it's me, Jimmy Murphy. It's to get to the near post. But there's still another, and it's number two for Bobby Charlton. Four-one, and that was that was the first half of extra time. That's how history is made. Everybody makes for Matt Busby, you know, because now all the, the problems that they've had in the past were, were, were finished. He'd achieved, he'd achieved his goal and won the European Cup. And everybody was making for him, you know, and I was a bit worried about him because they were pushing and pulling him and one thing and another. And, and then we went upstairs, got the trophy, which was very heavy because we were very tired. Now Manchester United have become the first victors from England. Bobby's tears still flowed the elation and triumph, and still the tragic remembrance of things past. It had been 10 years since Munich, and 10 years too since his first match for England. Uh, Billy Wright played, Tom Finney played. Can you imagine me, little lad, who used to go and, and idolise people like that at Newcastle? And here I'm actually playing in an international match with them. I, th I really think that events had taken over uh, after the accident so quickly I couldn't really comprehend what was going on at playing for England in an international match. Because we were playing matches every other day to catch up the fixtures that had been lost. And the England match was just one of them thrown in. And uh, I really didn't think about it, otherwise I think I might have frozen. England in the white shirts meet Scotland at Hampden Park in the last game of the season soccer internationals. The Scotland kickoff. It's not only the last game, it's the deciding one. For the winner will share the championship with Ireland, but a draw will leave Ireland as outright champions. So the pack stands are ready for anything. Well, almost. Brian Douglas slips an neat one from the right wing to Johnny Haynes, but goalie Younger collects. Then from a free kick taken by Bobby Charlton, Douglas heads goal number one for England. Douglas beats Murray and passes to Derek Kevin, who shoots, and that's number two. Things look black for Scotland, and they rally their forces for a counter-attack. Jackie Mudie heads, but he bounces off the bar, and a defender puts it out of play. The second half, and the English goal is under pressure, but Eddie Hopkinson isn't bothered. Bill Slater starting an English attack. He passes to Douglas. Douglas beats Haddock and cuts inside. But Tommy Younger pushes it away and McCall clears. But Tom Finney is soon bringing it back again. He beats Alec Parker. He centers and Bobby Charlton runs in for a magnificent goal. All I can remember about that was not that it was a tremendous goal, but I got a pass from Tom Finney. You know, it's absolutely superb. Early days for England had been in charge of the studious Walter Winterbottom, who had been hamstrung by the FA's narrow creeds. When Alf Ramsey, a former player, had taken over, the side began to take wing, or rather didn't. England, at that, up to Alf Ramsey, had not had a great record playing away from home. And I remember this match, 4-3-3, working to perfection, because we played without wingers, and the Spanish had two fullbacks standing outside, and I can remember them to this day looking across at one another because there was nobody there for them to mark. Automatically, when a team comes on the field and the match starts, they say, right, there's my winger, you see. Well, suddenly they're playing in a match when there wasn't a winger. So they're looking across at each other, you know. And while they were doing all this, we were piling through the middle in hordes. And we, although we only beat them 2-0, we beat them very, very convincingly. So and that was, I think that was when the, the, uh, 4-3-3 was accepted by the, per the press and the public at large. 
Before the 1966 World Cup, with a balmy sort of boldness, Ramsey promised England will win. He knew in attack he had the grandeur of one Charlton, and at the back he chose the lanky lad called Jack. Yet auguries were not good. England set off with a nervous sheepishness. Someone had to get a grip. Mexico, I remember, because I, I scored a goal which everybody keeps bringing to my mind, uh, where I carried the ball a long way and then finished up by shooting from a great distance outside the box. Now it's Charlton, Bobby Charlton, hand on the right. Maybe a shot from Charlton. It's worth trying. I can remember thinking to myself, if they allow me to go another five yards, I'm gonna, I'll be able to have a, a dig, you know. Had they attacked me, I would have had to lay it off, but they didn't. And I thought, right, and, and I just hit the ball at the general direction of the goals. And, and there again, old Jimmy Murphy saying, if you get round the goals, don't let them, th don't try and pick a spot, just hit the goals and let them worry about it. And that's what I did. And so England were on their way to a semi-final and waiting for them were Portugal and of course, Eusebio. All I remember was it was a super game played very fast, just the way we like it, certainly. Um, up and down, you know, balls not across. Gordon Banks was in form, our kid was in form. Bobby Moore, I, I didn't worry about one of our players. Rich screaming on someone now, and it's through to Hunt. Charlton has scored! Bobby Charlton gets his 39th goal for England. England playing some lovely stuff now. 16 is Peters. Eusebio, two for six England defenders between him and the goal as yet. Torres to Jose Augusto. Torres streaking now for the far post. And here's Eusebio, a beautiful shot. You notice how he hit that with the outside of his right foot. It swerved and Banks saw it all the way. Great save by Banks. The time beginning to run out for Portugal. This is more now to Cohen. England making Portugal chase. And it's Hurst. Five minutes running by Hurst back to Charlton. This could be it, it is. And that could be the goal that puts England in the final. Alf being the professional, you know, it wasn't enough to get to the final, you know, we had to win it. And so there's still a lot of work to be done and um, play the Germans who weren't particularly frightened of them. Uh, and yet a little break uh, after, after we'd been playing for a quarter of an hour or so, I think Ray Wilson misjudged the header and took off at the wrong time and knocked it right to the feet of Haller who, who scored. And uh, suddenly, you know, it was a proper football match. Bobby Charlton. <laughs> now, Moore moving up with the attack. And brought down by Overath. With a free kick. In goes! That's an equaliser! Ball with the corner. 
Hurst. What a chance at goal for you! Peters! And we've won. No, we've won the World Cup, you know. Because 2-1, nobody's going to come back now. We're, and we have complete faith in all the other players in the team. And it's a free kick to West Germany. One minute to go, just 60 seconds. Every Englishman coming back, every German going forward. Now, will the Germans snatch a dramatic equaliser and bring us to extra time? It's Emmerich coming in. And he's... Oh, yes, it must do! They have done! Weber has scored in the last seconds. I couldn't believe it. And when we got to, to kick off, we kicked off, and, and I couldn't believe he blew, he blew for full time. I thought, God, we, were, we, were, we were as close to that, to winning. I couldn't believe it. Just 20 minutes of the game left. Here's Ball running himself daft. And now Hurst, can he do it? He has that, yes! Yes! No, no, the linesman says no. The linesman says no. It's a goal! It's a goal! Oh, and the Germans go mad at the referee. This line, uh, uh, the linesman who can only speak Russian and Turkish. Any second now, it will all be over. 30 seconds by. Ah, watch the Germans are going down and they can hardly get up. It's all over, I think. No, it's... He's got some people are on the pitch. They think it's all over. It is now. It's four. And Charlton. And the players bring themselves down. Alf Ramsey walking forward to shake his hand. There is Alf Ramsey, the first sign of emotion from this man who has organized this victory. Bobby Moore comes up to receive the Jules Rimet trophy for England. Every one of us, you know, I mean, we were all pals and we're still all pals to this day. And uh, like we've done it, you know, in this achievement as a team, we, we've done it. And thinking, and the, the, the din of all the crowd cheering and cheering and cheering. It's the only thing that ever upsets me when I hear a load of people that are, that are happy and, and are choked up a bit. Because, like, the end of. Well, not the end of my career, but like the, the peak of your career, you can never do anything more than to be the best in the world. And, and now nobody can ever tell you that you're not. We were the best in the world and we proved it. And we, we, we played at home, which was, a, a, I would have loved really, if I had one ambition, was to have won the World Cup abroad somewhere. Done. And we were good enough. I would have liked to have done that, but it wasn't in our hands where we played. Bobby Charlton, England's captain for the night, playing in his 100th international for his country, waits to make his sentimental journey across the Wembley Stadium. A stadium he's graced so often with distinction. The face of the man whom every footballing schoolboy would wish to emulate. And just listen to the crowd as Charlton leads out England. With that late stroke, he crowned a supreme and joyful talent in which for 17 years as a player, he had displayed never an aimless improvisation, nor as a man knowingly fouling to sully a sportsmanship that was always certain, wide-eyed and unfaltering.
After Ramsey substituted him in the Mexico World Cup of 1970, when this time they were beaten by West Germany, it was his last appearance in an England shirt. And, well, England have never quite been the same since. By the next World Cup, four years later, Bobby Charlton had even left our domestic fields and played this last match for his beloved United. Brother Jack retired that very same Saturday tea time. The hero was honoured in abundance, of course. Briefly, he tried management at folksy, once proud Preston, but they were less clamorous terraces and dramas than he'd been used to for over 20 years. Backstage, it was a different sort of hurly-burly. When I finished at Preston, I thought to myself, well, you've had football non-stop playing and clubs and internationals and management. You've been in managing now. You've never been without the game. And I thought to myself, to be fair to my wife, why don't I try it without football for a while? He had met Norma in 1961. It has been the most perfect of all his matches. It was more important because it was a team game. Yeah. It was a... It was a team game, and you were so keen not to let your uh, daughter let the rest of the team down, you know. He enjoys his daughter's gymkhanas, where he acts as stable lad and groom. He drives the horse box, and then brings up the rear with his bucket and spade. Come on, Look to the grass over there. Yeah. It's been it's been marvellous, really, for the for the family, and it's kept us together as a family. Um, horses, uh, they can't go without me because I've got to drive them. I've got to put the trailer on the back, and and we spend we spend a lot of time together, revolving round the ponies. And do you wear your check been cap? No, I don't wear a <laughs> I uh, I just go and do whatever they tell me. They're the bosses, you know, and it's what it's to do with the ponies. I just say, all right, I'll do it. Well, will you teach me to do some? Hey, go on, show, show me how to do it. Go on. Oh, now flick it up onto your head. Hey, hey, me. Toss him a football and he still can't resist. It's a busy retirement. He's involved with a successful travel agency, is a television commentator and travels the world giving soccer coaching clinics. Bobby Charlton is still obsessed with his lovely game. If I can sort of just give something that I got, and hopefully they'll, it goes in one ear and doesn't, doesn't go out the other, it actually stays there, then I think it holds them in good stead for the future. And, and I do like my coaching, and I love getting a response back from, from young lads. Football is, is so exciting, and you feel part of it, and, and when you see 11 men knitting together and and doing something that, that's really, in, in a way, sometimes artistic. It's so, so lovely to watch. Um, I don't think that you can better it. Exciting, artistic, lovely to watch. Now it's Charlton, Bobby Charlton, hand on the right. Maybe a shot from Charlton. It's worth trying. <laughs> what football is to Charlton? Well, simply, Charlton was to football. And you couldn't better that.